are uh, several shops now starting to get into these transmissions and starting to work on them. So we're going to give you a little introduction to these trans as they have some basics of the understanding of what's different between them and the five-speed units, as well as some of the little pitfalls you may run into when it comes to the service of this particular transmission. Let's do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Before we get started here today, I'd like to thank the guys from Steel Aftermarket Products again. They are uh, a great group of guys that have helped us a bunch to support uh, getting training out to the industry. So again, uh, thank you guys from the Steel Aftermarket Products group. When it comes to connections, most of you guys have heard me talk about this before. So again, if you're new, you need to pay attention to the thing. If not, you can ignore me for a minute. Uh, connections need, need to make sure you're a hardwired type connection rather than a wireless connection. We've had some issues with wireless routers. The handout itself is a PDF format handout. You should be able to print your handout with an Adobe type program or physically view the handout with an Adobe program. So again, when you're all said and done, your handout uh, information should pop up and you better print or store whatever you want to have. If you have a question as we're going through our presentation today, feel free to ask the question. By far the simplest way to do that is to simply type your question in the questions box hit the submit key and it automatically is going to pop up on my screen and I'll try to answer your question at that point. There's going to be an automated survey that follows this presentation. So again, we appreciate you filling the automated survey out. What we've got coming down the pipe towards you, uh, April, your next presentation is going to be April 8th. So mark your calendar for April 8th, uh, same time, same place. We're going to deal with the Toyota U250 transmission. So. Uh, the Toyota U250, we're going to take a look at not only how does it work, but some of the common product issues that we get ourselves into, both valve body wear issues as well as other things that you may not need to uh, pay attention to. We're going to follow that up in two weeks from then with the uh, O1J, the Volkswagen O1J transmission itself, which is a CVT type transmission. Uh, so we're going to take you through that operation on the 22nd of April. So those are the next two that I've got to laid out for, information laid out for, and we've got on the schedule, so we should be ready to go with those. I'd like to send a thanks out to a young man from uh, Southern Illinois University, Sean Boyle. He helped me tremendously by giving me a bunch of pictures of this transmission. He did a really nice job taking some really cool artwork uh, pictures that he shared with me and I'm sharing with you guys. So again, thanks to uh, Sean. I certainly appreciate his help. This transmission, of course, was released here a couple of years ago. As you can see there on your screen, uh, released in the Odyssey, then followed up with the Accord. It's since then gone to some of the other transmission applications that are out there. You're going to see this transmission becoming the baseline transmission for Honda for quite some time. Uh, there's scuttlebutt right now about them following this up with the uh, ZF Type 9 speed, uh, but right now this will be the baseline transmission that you're going to see in the uh, Honda applications. Honda actually refers to it as the H6 as in Henry VI. So uh, when you deal with the Honda folks, that's what they basically call it. Now, <clears throat> this page here I just added here this morning. You don't have it in your handout, but it's actually included in the handout as we move on. It's just I wanted to put it on one page to try to cover everything at one shot. So what we're talking about here is some of the changes, some of the differences you might see. Uh, first off, this is the transmission that has a line pressure cell on it. Your other Hondas, of course, do not. They use the movement of the stator support to uh, give you a line pressure boost. This Honda here is the first one to actually have a line pressure solenoid. It works just like the Chrysler's. It's controlling pressure reduction, not pressure increase. One of the exciting things on this transmission is the use of the CPC solenoids. You guys have seen them on Hondas for many, many years. They are a very complicated hydraulic circuit that they had before. They made it extremely simplistic when it comes to this trans. So this is good news for us because rather than the oil pressure having to go through 15 valves to get to the clutch, it doesn't do that anymore. It simply goes from the circuit for that valve directly to the clutch, and a CPC solenoid controls that pressure going to the clutch. You're going to have a couple of accumulators in this transmission first and fourth. You will also have some CPC accumulators that you never had before. Uh, the CPC accumulators are there to take out the pressure pulsations out of the CPC circuit. You're going to have a multiple disc clutch inside of the uh, uh, converter itself, very similar to some of the Mercedes and some of the other transmissions you may run across. Uh, this is self-contained within the converter itself. Every clutch except for first has a pressure switch and an air bleed bolt, which 
I just find this really intriguing. They've actually got bolts in this transmission that have holes drilled into the bolts to bleed the air right out of the uh, circuit itself. So they do not have problems with aeration in the uh, transmission feed circuit itself. All right, so now let's get into the transmission itself. This is a five shaft unit. So we've updated from a four shaft now to a five shaft when they went to six speeds. As you can see, I've laid the shaft out for you, input shaft, main shaft, secondary shafts. We have plenty of shafts here. The gears on the shafts themselves, just like a manual transmission, are in constant mesh with the gears on the counter shaft. The gears themselves are, in some instances, locked to the shaft. In some instances, we actually use a clutch to lock the gear to the shaft to make the different uh, gears, of course, occur. So when you take this transmission apart, you're going to find the majority of the gears that you deal with are free-floating gears like a manual transmission would be. Uh, the clutch actually is used to lock the gear to the shaft. As you can see, we've got six clutches and one one-way clutch. The neat thing here is the clutches are named after what they do. you got a first clutch, a second clutch, a third clutch, and so forth. So it makes it very easy as far as uh, power flow. Valve body itself, you're going to have multiple valve bodies. We've got valve bodies for valve bodies in this transmission. You've got a main valve body, a regulator valve body, secondary valve body. You name it, we've got it. And there's going to be different valves in the different valve bodies. Solenoids, you've got a series of PWM solenoids. Those are what we would call the CPC solenoids or clutch pressure control solenoids. They're registered as A, B, C, and D. Uh, again, they're going to be controlling your clutch pressure, your apply pressure of clutch. And then you've got to have some on-off solenoids. You're going to have an A, B, actually you have a C in there too, I forgot to put in. And then a line pressure solenoid. So again, bottom line is a lot of changes here in how this particular portion of the design actually functions. As I talked about earlier, your CPC cell rates are in direct control of your shift field. So you don't have to go through 56 different valves in order to get oil pressure to the clutch. Your CPC solenoid controls a valve, which in turn controls the oil pressure going to the clutch itself directly. So again, operates different than the other Hondas operate, much, much simpler operation. Your line pressure solenoid is a pressure reduction solenoid very similar to a Chrysler and several other uh, manufacturers we've talked about through the years out there. But Chrysler is probably the one you guys are most aware of. Uh, the solenoid itself actually reduces pressure, not increases pressure. Your pressure switches, as you can see, open at uh, 36 pounds, or excuse me, close at 36 pounds, open at 31 pounds. And as you can see, there are a whole bunch of pressure switches. We've got a second gear clutch, which is the A switch, B switch, and third gear, C fourth clutch. Uh, D fifth clutch, and of course the E pressure switch is the sixth clutch. They use these pressure switches primarily to measure the shift time of the transmission itself. So this is an adaptive strategy uh, input is what it primarily is. As you can see, we've got a multiple disc clutch inside the converter itself. That clutch is rebuildable. If you are a converter company, you can buy parts for it and physically go through and rebuild it. As you can also see, we have converter clutch from first gear through sixth gear uh, when you're driving the vehicle normal operation. So again, they're going to be uh, basically slipping this clutch at lower road speeds. They bring it in very low road speed and slip the heck out of the clutch itself. It's a wet style multiple disc clutch so they don't damage the clutch. The fluid that we're going to call for in this transmission is what they call a Honda TW1 fluid. That is the approved factory fill for it. Uh, again, if you've been around Hondas at all, you know how critical it is to use their particular fluid. The coefficient of friction of their friction discs, both the static and dynamic coefficients of friction, get you in major trouble if you try to substitute fluid. So our position at ATRA is we always use the fluid that manufacturers suggest to use in their vehicle. Uh, we've had just too much trouble with guys trying to substitute fluid. So in this instance, what we're going to tell you to use is the ATF DW1, which Honda, of course, has available for this six-speed. This is a look at the transmission itself. You've got the rear case half basically taken off the trans, so you can see how the gears are laid out. And there now some of those gears, like the counter shaft, which is the second one from the left there, some of those gears are hooked to the shaft itself. Some of the gears are not. Those gears are actually uh, on a bearing, very similar to what you would have with a uh, manual transmission. And we use the clutch packs that you can see there 
the clutch drums to actually lock the gear or unlock the gear from the shaft. So the layout of the transmission is fairly simple. It's got five shafts on the inside of it. You can see all the shafts right there. When we look at the uh, side view of the trans, as you can see, we've got a solenoid here. We've got a couple of pressure taps here. Uh, take a look at your speed sensors. You've got a main shaft speed sensor and a counter shaft speed sensor right there. We flip the transmission a little bit further over, and now you can see the solenoid block. That solenoid block, if you notice, has got some solenoids on the right-hand side of the block and some solenoids on the left-hand side of the block. Now, the attention I want to bring to this is the solenoids on the right-hand side of the block. You see there are four of them. Those are your CPC solenoids. They are cast as part of the solenoid block. So it's going to take somebody pretty innovative to come up with a solution here where you don't have to replace the solenoid assemblies when you replace, or I should say, the solenoid block when you replace the solenoid itself. Because right now, the way this is serviced is that you buy that whole solenoid block anytime you have a CPC solenoid that's giving you troubles. We flip the transmission over a little further, and now you can see the uh, pressure ports and pressure switches on the other side of the trans itself. So you get a good look at those. A close-up of those switches, as you can see, they've got the switches numbered for which gear the switch is used in or which clutch it's actually used for. Uh, so again, pretty self-explanatory. We rotate the transmission around. So now the bell housing is pointing away from us. Uh, first thing I want to bring your attention, upper left-hand corner, you see those four CPC solenoids right there. Those are the guys we've talked about that you have to buy with the solenoid block. Just to the right of that, you'll see a couple of green switches. Those are pressure switches. So those are part of your clutch pressure switch uh, mechanism you have with this trans. Then just to the right of those, you'll see that black uh, triangle-shaped device. That is your Prindle switch. And just to the right of that, you see the red circle. That gives you your tag code. And of course, on the bottom of the case, you're seeing your temperature sensor. We rotate it around to where the uh, bell housing is facing forward. When you do that, you can again see some more pressure switches and pressure ports to take a look at. All right, let's take a look at the shafts. Sean came up with some outstanding pictures for me on these shafts. He had one of these, and he got some pictures for me, and I, again, really appreciate this, because this is how the gear set actually sets in the transmission. We got a top view of actually how it's setting in there. So the shaft on the left-hand side, that's going to be your secondary shaft. The middle shaft, as you can see, that's your counter shaft. Then, of course, you have your either gear shaft. Then, of course, along with that, or to the right of that, the main shaft. And finally, last but not least, the third shaft. Now, I do want to bring your attention to that third shaft. If you look at that, that set of small gears, between that, you'll see a shift sleeve. That's about the only mechanically shifted thing in this transmission. That's your reverse of this box. And that shift sleeve, as you're going to see a little bit, is a directional sleeve, just like it is in a lot of manual transmissions. So, Again, you're going to actually have a shift fork in this trans shifting that shift sleeve. The clutch layout, the clutches, of course, are laid out on the shafts. So as you can see here, that uh, uh, shaft on the left-hand side, we got the first clutch, fifth clutch, and second clutch. That's all on the secondary shaft there. The counter shaft, as you can see, has got a one-way clutch built into it. And of course, like any other Sprague one-way clutch, that one-way clutch will be directional. And I'll show you how the one-way clutch goes in. The main shaft that you see, which is the third one to your right there, uh, that's got the sixth clutch and the third clutch on it. And finally, the last shaft on your right-hand side, uh, that's going to house your fourth clutch. So that's the layout of all the clutches in this particular trans. So again, what the clutches basically do is lock a particular gear to the shaft so we in turn get uh, the gear ratio that we desire out of that particular uh, shaft assembly. Now this is what I thought was really cool about this transmission right here. As we talked about earlier, there's a whole bunch of these bleed bolts. Uh, so the bleed bolts, if you look at the picture I've got in the lower right-hand corner, the big giant blue arrow going to it, I'm trying to show you the bleed hole in these. The idea of the bleed bolt is to get rid of any air that you have trapped in the clutch circuit itself. So the basic gist of everything is to try to keep you from having aerated oil going to a clutch, 
of course, that area in oil is compressible, which means we're going to end up with a slip issue. So uh, kind of an interesting approach to trying to control uh, aeration within a clutch pack. So rather than having a, uh, a check ball capsule or something like that, they've gone to a very simplistic approach to try to control air uh, distribution into the clutch packs themselves. So when we pressurize that passage, of course, the air will move in front of the hydraulic oil, and the oil will then push the air out to the little teeny weeny bleed hole. We're rotating the transmission onto her belly right now, showing you the selenide block. Again, the selenide's up on top. Looks like the missile silos up on top of that selenide block. There's four of them there. Those are my CPC selenides. My regular shift solids are actually the guys down on the bottom that you're seeing there. And the devices in green there, those are my pressure switches. Now, one of the things Sean had his machine shop do for me, which I just really appreciate, was he did a cutaway of this thing. So you can actually see the layout of the valves and how everybody lays in that solenoid block, which is really pretty cool. So again, those CPC solenoids are permanently mounted. Uh, the other stuff is replaceable, but those guys are permanently mounted in there. And so right now, the way it sets, if you lose a CPC solenoid, you get to buy that whole enchilada that you see right there. Now, the evolution of CPC hydraulics in this transmission, effectively what they did, guys, was this. They made our life much, much simpler. So instead of having to trace down 15 different valves that the oil went through before it got to a clutch, we effectively have this working just like other transmissions work. Solenoid moves a valve. Oil pressure going through the valve, we're going to regulate. And that oil pressure goes through the valve directly to the clutch or a couple clutches. That's what we're telling you right here. Uh, so the bottom line is that pressure itself controls the valve. Valve then, of course, controls pressure goes to one or two clutches. Very, very simplistic approach. Again, it made your diagnostics much, much simpler. So when you get a hydraulic schematic uh, for one of these out, because you've got an issue, you'll find out that diagnosing one of these is much easier than diagnosing the old uh, uh, five-speed units, the four-shaft five-speeds, or obviously any of the four-speeds that were out there. Giving you a solenoid application chart, showing you when the solenoids are physically on. So again, you're going to know what's on and when it's on. And now we're going to take a look at the actual valve bodies themselves. So as I told you earlier, there are a couple of accumulators in this transmission. You've got a first gear accumulator, and of course you've got a fourth gear accumulator. The first gear accumulator is mounted in the manual valve body, and uh, the uh, manual valve is also, of course, in the manual valve body there. The other valve bodies we're going to look at, first one we're going to take a look at is the regulator valve body because it contains the uh, pressure regulator valve. So as you can see, there's a regulator valve, PCC regulator valve, uh, your lockup control valve, cooler relief valve, and of course your fourth gear accumulator is also housed within that regular, uh, regulator valve body itself. Main valve body, these can basically house the majority of the uh, components. We do have a couple shift valves that are not housed in here, but the majority of the components are. So you can see the shift valves, inhibit valves, uh, lubrication valves, uh, obviously lockup valves, and so forth. Now, notice they're using the in plug just like the other transmissions have used. If this transmission holds true, you're going to not only have valve body wear, but you'll have also in plug leakage uh, if it's like a lot of the other Hondas that we deal with. So uh, we'll see how this thing works out, but I'm expecting we'll run into the exact same type of problems that we ran into with the other Honda applications. We're looking at the secondary valve body here now. A secondary valve body, as you can see, has got the two shift valves. I told you that we're not in the other valve body. They're mounted in here, shift A and shift B. And of course, you also house, house the CPC accumulators into that valve body. So these accumulators control your uh, buildup pressure for that apply of that particular clutch. So again, fairly simple layout. Again, uh, these are a little bit different in design. You notice they've got seals on them, which is kind of a nice feature. Uh, on these particular uh, accumulators, because a lot of transmissions, of course, we don't. They just use metal to metal. Now let's take a look at the repair side of this trans. This trans is fairly simple when it comes to repair. First thing you're going to notice is you don't have mystery pipes in this trans. And what I basically mean by that, those of you guys have done some of these other transmissions, you have pipes for pipes. And of course, you get all the pipes laying out on the bench, and two weeks later when you're putting it back together, 
you wonder where did this pipe ever go? I can't figure out where this pipe went. Well, you don't have that issue with this transmission. The pipes that you have or actually have are these 11 tubes that you can see right here. They bolt onto a manifold. So these pipes have all got seals built into them, and we're telling you to be careful not to damage those because your feed pressures are actually going through those. On one end of them, you got an O-ring. And so we're looking at the end with the O-ring that's closest to the outside of it that faces the manifold that bolts on there. So it's facing towards us in this picture. Uh, the other thing is there's, see, uh, there's actually screens at the bottom of these uh, uh, feed tubes. So we're telling you to make sure that you pay attention to those screens to make certain that they're not plugged with debris. Here's a side look at these tubes. So again, notice they're all about the same height. They are the same tubes, so you could put them back in any hole. Uh, just make sure, again, that the O-rings are as close to the manifold as you can get them. Now, most of you guys have dealt with these Hondas before. And you know we've had some troubles with the nuts on these Hondas. I don't see that this is going to be much different. As you can see, that nut is staked in place, so you've got to knock the stake loose. The other thing you got to be careful of is the fact that this is a left-hand thread nut. So you get your million-pound impact wrench out there and start hammering on this thing, you're not going to have a nut or threads obviously left uh, to be able to put this thing back together with it. Remember, it's a left-handed thread nut. And again, you're going to want to make sure you restake the nut or use some Loctite of the nut when you put it back together because the bottom line, guys, is we've had a lot of troubles with these Hondas with those nuts loosening up. So bottom line here, make sure, again, you get the nuts to proper torque and use some sort of process to hold that nut in place when you're all said and done. When you look at the washer on the bottom picture, you notice that there's an X on that washer. You can clearly see it in this picture. Uh, that X itself faces the nut. A lot of these washers are directional in this trans. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go to the next picture. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So the washers themselves will typically have steps on a whole bunch of different washers with inside this unit. You have to note what position that step is in because it is directional. So you're not going to be able to get your stack up right if you in turn do not have those washers put in the right direction. The other thing is, you notice on the bottom picture there, we've got some oil baffles. Uh, this transmission is full of these black baffles. The baffles are there to hold the oil up into the gear train, so we provide lubrication for the gear sets themselves. So again, uh, leaving those baffles out and finding them on the bench and thinking to yourself, well, God, I'm not going to go through all that work to put it back together. Well, you definitely need to do that because that's where your lubrication comes from uh, for this transmission is those baffles. Now, we're going to give you a different approach to getting this transmission apart than what your shop manual is going to give you. The shop manual basically has you take all those gear sets I just showed you. You have to take them all out as a set. Well, that means that you have to have everybody in the shop, plus everybody you can find on the street corner's hands, to be able to go in here and grab a hold of all these shafts and pick everything out of there at one time. It's not a one-man band. So we're going to approach it, approach it a different way. I'm going to give you some steps here. We're going to remove the second gear from the counter shaft, then we're going to remove, obviously, the main shaft, the third shaft, then we're going to pull the 2-5 the clutch drum out and the secondary shaft out. So. At that point, we can then dish the other shaft out of the transmission case one by one. So you're saying to yourself, well, that sounds a lot simpler. Well, it is, except for one little quirk. This is the quirk right here. That counter shaft has a press fit bearing on it. And you do not do what I'm showing you in this picture. I'm showing you how not to do it right here. If you do what you're sh being shown in this picture, you will break that gear. I've got some gears that, that obviously got some teeth knocked out of them to show you exactly that's what will happen to you. So this process is not the process I want you to use. Instead, what I want you to do is do what we're going to show you right now, which is get a bearing spreader out, hook the bearing spreader to the bearing, hook your puller up, and physically pull the bearing off. Now, the reason you couldn't do it with the rigger gear puller is because you're not just pulling the bearing. You're pulling the bearing and a press fit sleeve off of there. So you're going to end up with so much press uh, tension on that shaft that if that puller slips at all, you're going to end up damaging the gear. So we're telling you pull the bearing off first 
and then go back in with a jaw puller to pull the sleeve off. Now, we're showing you how to correctly use. This is a snap-on puller here. I'm sure everybody and their dog has one of these in their shop with the link that goes across because you're going to definitely need that to hold the polar edges together. If not, it's going to want to pop off. It's going to break the sleeve. The other words of wisdom I have for you is when you go back together, treat this like a manual transmission. Take this to your toaster oven. Heat that sleeve up nice and toasty. That sleeve will slide down by itself rather than trying to press it on with a press. You will save yourself lots of headaches if you use heat for reassembly of some of this stuff. So very simple process. Put it in the toaster oven. Heat it up just like you would a piece of toast. Uh, leave it in there for four or five minutes. Pull it out with some welding gloves on. Slide her down over the shaft and off to the race as you go. Well, manual transitions is an extremely common, common process we use with manuals is to use a toaster oven. So with that said, that shows you how to get that off. You can then fish the gear off of there, and then you can fish the rest of your shafts out of the transmission. This is showing you pulling the rest of the shafts out of the box. So we're saying in order to get the, some of the shafts apart, you're going to have to use a hydraulic press. That's true. If you're going back together, again, my words of wisdom, wherever you can, heat the component up with a toaster oven. And again, we would not be doing bearings this way, but we'd be doing sleeves and gears this way. Uh, heat it up with a toaster oven. She'll go right in place without having to press anything. As I told you, you need to pay a close attention to that reverse gear taper. Here I'm trying to show you a close-up with the big giant blue arrow, uh, which direction that thing goes. So the collar's got some tapered teeth, and they face the tapered teeth on the gear. When it comes to the uh, shafts themselves, pulling the shafts apart, the only real tricky thing here is the fact that you have to pull that 12 millimeter Allen out of the end of that uh, uh, shaft assembly as you're seeing there in order to be able to get the bearing off. That Again, that Allen is a left-hand thread. So don't create yourself hate and discontent by trying to use your impact wrench and drive it in. You've got to drive it the other way. The Sprag itself is a larger Sprag than the 5-speed used. It is directional just like any other transmission Sprag is. How you tell the direction of the Sprag is the same way you've always told it. We, I always use the assembly plant method. When you go to a, a manufacturer's assembly plant, you see that lip on the Sprag? That lip always goes in the direction of power flow. So effectively, we're saying the power is going towards that gear. So you put the lip towards that gear, and you're going to be a happy camper. At a manufacturing plant, they don't take the time of rotating parts. They just know where the lip goes. That's the reason that lip was actually manufactured on the Sprag itself. Again, been that way since Moby Dick was a minnow. When you get into the converter itself, as you can see, you got a multiple disc clutch. I'm showing you two clutches in there. Uh, one, that top picture shows a clutch apart. The bottom right-hand picture where I got the big honking blue arrow going to it, that, of course, is showing the clutch together inside the converter. Those clutch pieces you see up on top up there are all serviceable. Uh, if you're a converter company, you can buy those pieces. Going to have a whole bunch of pressure taps on here, basically pressure taps for every year. Uh, these pressure taps themselves typically are going to be apply pressure taps. So what does that mean to me in simple English? That means I have the ability to measure pressure going directly to the clutch, so after the orifice. So I can see if I'm having pressure issues right at that clutch pack. I can also see that i got a line pressure tap and a TCC tap there. Now the pressure specs we're giving you here, the only thing you really got to pay attention to is the service limit. The service limit is the bottom side limit. So we're saying everybody's a happy camper unless you drop below, in this instance, 156 pounds. If you drop below it, then we have a problem. We need to take a hard look at that. So we're looking at first, second, fourth, and sixth gear right now. Again, pressure limits, 156 pounds. So there should be no less than 156 pounds going to that clutch. Apply pressure testing, third and fifth gear clutches themselves. As you can see, again, they give you the pressure limits, tell you how to do the check. TCC, nothing different here. Uh, we're saying you should have a minimum of 37 pounds. Uh, the standard for the thing should be around 43 pounds. Well, that pretty well completes our presentation for the day, guys. We're right on time. Um, again, appreciate, appreciate the guys from uh, CL Aftermarket Products uh, for sponsoring us. Let me talk about some questions. It says, are the bolts with the bleed holes designed for each clutch, or do they differ in hole size or where they go? No, as far as I am aware of anyway, 
the bleed holes themselves are generic. So that bleed hole is the same no matter which bolt you had the bleed hole in. Great question, though. I guess I've never actually got down and measured them with a, with a uh, wire gauge or anything like that, but they look to be just about identical in size. So I would have to say they're probably generic as far as uh, the hole size themselves are concerned. Good questions. Any other questions you guys have, uh, send right over to me. Again, remember your uh, next presentation is going to be on April 8th. And we're going to be talking about the Toyota U250 transmission. Well, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions popping up. So again, when we're all done with this, you're going to have an automated survey that pops up. Appreciate you guys' time, and you have yourself a great week. And we'll see you two weeks from today.